on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I'm very bored by likable characters. I prefer films and books where the character is flawed. And I would argue that it's actually easier to engage an audience with a flawed character. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show. My name is James Blatch. My name is Mark Dawson. You're so much quieter than me. I know. You've got your badge on. I do, just because people, people forget who I am. We should say that we're recording this from a Las Vegas hotel room. Uh, and actually, ironically, what happens in Vegas is going out on our podcast. We've broken the rule. We've broken the first rule of Vegas. It doesn't stay in Vegas. That's very true. Not yeah. everything is going to go out there. Some um, things have to stay in Vegas. We are recording this rap uh, at uh, Sam's Town in Vegas, which is the home of 20 Books Conference this year. So it's currently, where, where are we? November? Mm. Yes. Is, so it's still November, I think, when this is going out, because it's contem so. contemporaneous. And this is the world's weirdest hotel. They have this animatronic thing. Uh, perhaps John could swing around. It's just been in full voice. It's, uh, it's got a stuffed bear. I think it's fleas on it. I wouldn't go too close to it. Got a, what, an or oryx? Is that called? I don't know. What, the thing on the right? An eagle. It's an eagle, yes. And there's a wolf that appears. It's hilarious. And every two hours, it bursts into life. And it does a very powerful and moving sequence, which says... I am an American, I think. I was in tears. I know. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. Now, it's, um, this is the off-strip part of Vegas, so you get all those big plush hotels on the strip uh, and the travel lodges in between. And this is kind of kitsch, I guess. It's sort of old, let's try and do something a bit cheaper and tackier. Even cheaper and tackier. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that, James. You're insulting the hotel and, and the conference. It's a lovely hotel. I think people come here for the history. Um, now we have two Patreon supporters to well. I don't think we've ever welcomed Patreon supporters live in person. Um, but they are J.D. Lassica, a fellow thriller writer, and uh, Alana Delacroix. I think if we welcome them live in person, you really should visit them. Because actually, knock on the door. J.D. Lassica is here. We could, yeah, go and shake their hands. I, I, saw, I saw him earlier. I'm not sure if Alana Delacroix is here. But anyway, we want to say thank you very much indeed to both of you for supporting us. If you go to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show you can uh, support us for as little as a dollar an episode and feel a part of the team okay right we have a great interview today we have an interview with an, i think probably our first oscar nominated interviewee not probably definitely definitely our first oscar nominated interviewee we've had a pulitzer prize winner before have we yeah. yes who won the pulitzer prize do you remember we interviewed him in uh, New York. J.D. Salinger. It wasn't J.D. Yeah. Salinger, I would have remembered. John, John Sanford. John Sanford, was he a Pulitzer? Yes, John Sanford won a Pulitzer oh, for Prize for his journalism yeah. before he started writing he did. novels uh, to pay the books, pay the bills. Okay, but uh, we're going to be talking to Terry Tatchell. Now, Terry is a screenwriter. Uh, she is a partner in more ways than one with a director called Neil Blomkamp. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to help me out here. No, I'm going to make you um, suffer. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, most famously, District 9 was the... the Which I classified. Did you classify? Uh, we should tell people what you used to do, so they understand well, what they mean by that. Yes, yeah, so we used to work at the BBC classifying films and giving them their age ratings. And I remember District 9 coming in, very excited, because there was mm. a lot of buzz about it, and thoroughly enjoyed it, and gave it, what did we give it, a 15? 15, probably. Yeah, I think yeah, 15. Yeah, we think it's a 15, yeah. Filthy prawn. Yes, there was a filthy it stayed, porn. It's a film that stays with you, isn't it? it I does. can still remember some, some lines from it. Okay. I had some filthy prawns last night. They're staying with me. <laughs> <well. laughs> yeah, they don't stay with you that long. That's no. the trouble with the filthy prawns. Um, okay, look, let's, uh, let's, let's throw to this interview. Uh, it was recorded in Vancouver, another part of this beautiful continent of North America. Um, and it was really interesting talking to Terry about the evolution of, a, of a, you know, what turned out to be a very successful screenplay, how it started. And, um, yeah, it's... It's a longer process than running an outline for a novel, uh, let's say that. Unless you're writing it. Unless I'm writing it, which goes as much quicker. Okay, let's hear from Terry, and then Mark and I will have a chat off the back of this. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Terry Tatchell, 
Welcome to the self-publishing show. Um, we're, normally I'm standing in rainy Huntingdon and somebody's in somewhere glamorous, but we've come to you. We're in Vancouver. I have put my I've put on my Canada hoodie to make you feel a little I, I bit more relaxed. I appreciate that very much. I wish I wish I had my London or England hoodie. Yeah, well, this is about you. It's not about <laughs> me. I've also brought a puff. Ah, which our is, Canucks. Um, uh, the what? The Canucks, the Vancouver Canucks. So we don't actually have explicit tags on this podcast, <laughs> but if you could uh, restrain yourself a little, um, yeah, no, it's an actual real puck from the NHL. So the Canucks, 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 Canucks. That's really how you say that. That is, it is. Not the Canucks. No, Canucks. It's a type of duck, right? Uh, I, I don't know. Oh, no. I think. No, I we'll don't get, think so. We'll maybe. get letters as soon as I say anything <laughs> yeah. like this. We get 15 emails from people who correct us. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to put the um, puck there. I've got my Canada jacket on here, or hoodie. And you brought us to make me feel at home. You brought us tea. Yes, I did. Uh, we, we call it high tea in North America so that we can sell it all day. Um, but it's afternoon tea, I believe, is, is what you know it to third be. third cameraman will eventually pick up on the fact we're talking about the tea. Uh, okay. Uh, so high tea. Do you think yes. that that's what we do in England at four o'clock every day? Yeah, high yeah, tea? yeah, yeah. Good. No, and that's look beautiful. It looks absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Now we're going to talk to you about screenwriting is the main thing that we'd okay. love to get out of this. But you also have a children's book, which is amazing, self-published. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit as well. Great. Is worth noting you're a bit of an entrepreneur. I mean, this tea has come from your tea shop, as you say. Yes, we just celebrated our six-year anniversary, and it's all kind of tied in, though the tea salon was a uh, sort of an antidote to the lonely writing and okay and yeah so it the lonely lifestyle uh, and you also have you dabble in wine yes we uh we have a, a little vineyard i would like to say i make the wine but i don't i just watch the grapes grow and pat myself on the back when i drink the wine and drink it yeah yeah obviously yeah. everyone involved in that <laughs> has that bit done okay well look tell you, um screenwriting is something that you you're got great accomplishment at and I think probably, do you think it's like your, would you say, if someone says to you, what do you do? And you had to come up with a one, one or two words to answer that. Would screenwriting I, I, be? I do screenwriter because that's, that's my primary means of income. That's, that's, yeah. That's the one that's paid the most bills. Yeah. The, the restaurant is a bit of a, of, of a fancy. And, <laughs> and your screenwriting, did that develop from other types of writing or was screenwriting always something from sort of university funny. you wanted no, to No, I mean, children's, I always wanted to write children's books. And I, I had, a, it, it hadn't occurred to me, like I'm sure everybody else, that, uh, that I could be a writer. It just seemed like a pipe dream. And so I went and I went to university for psychology. I worked at a bank. And then I had my daughter and I thought, if I'm going to be away from her and working on something, it better be worth it. And uh, so I did all those, what do you love and writing lists. And interestingly, I remember there was, I don't remember what the five things were, but I know one was movies and one was books, children's books. And so I was like, okay, children's books. And I went and did a writing class at the local college with, when I had my new baby and she's 20 now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, from that, I found out that there was a competition at Vancouver Film School, that there an international competition and they were giving away, and the, first of all, that there was a Vancouver Film School, and secondly, that they actually wrote screenwriting. And to back up a little bit, I had worked at a visual effects company and had broken down scripts. So I had actually, okay. Jumanji actually, I'd, I'd had my hands on a script. When you say broken down scripts, what do you mean? So you go through it and you say what would need visual effects and oh, okay. how much that would cost. And so I, I held it and so read every time it. Every they said thought, a thousand elephants then went through the living room. Yeah, exactly. Like, right, a lot of visual gonna effects. Require so some. We, did, we didn't get it. But, yeah. uh, but it, it definitely, so I, I knew what a script looked like and I knew its format. And I thought, well, if there's this competition, I'd be crazy. Crazy, crazy not to at least try. So I got how to write a screenplay in 21 days and wrote a screenplay in a weekend and sent it in and kind of forgot about it. And then I got a phone call saying that I was in the finals and they were going to interview me and on the phone. So they interviewed me on the phone and then I, then I found out I got the scholarship. Wow. And so I was able to go to film school for writing, which I would never have done otherwise because I would never, it felt like, such a crazy thing to say, I'm going to write movies at that time in my life anyway. So I was really excited that they had seen something in my writing and that they believed in me. And tell us about that 
script you put in you came up with in a weekend? It was, uh, I, I still have it. It was a, actually it was two. I did two. One was about a hyena. It was a kid's, uh, it was Hubert Hyena's first birthday, a kid's story. Okay. And then the other one was sort of a time slip uh, back to World War Two. Really? Uh, yeah, it was with it, less with fewer hyenas. Yeah, no hyenas. So okay. they're both kind of kid oriented. So I was still hanging on to my kid like leanings. And did you know because uh, screenwriting is quite a formatted process, isn't yes. it? Did you understand that at that stage? It, it was pretty easy to pick up. You, 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 there's software, isn't it? You can. Uh, I did it on Word at the time oh, okay. because I wasn't about to. Actually, I don't even know when the software came out. But yeah, I didn't really know if I would get the scholarship yeah, yeah. and it wasn't something that I thought well, well I'm gonna try this anyway because I was still onto the kids books but yeah it, it's it's not formatting really is not hard no okay yeah. well I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later we've had another screenwriter on who talked about that and he said you know the same thing that that's yeah. not not the challenge here yeah <laughs> no not of, at all <laughs> but you obviously at that stage had an instinct for writing for the screen well it was like I said my list was was books and movies and uh, I always laugh and tell the story about when I looked through my diaries when I was little in grade six. It was every every week was a movie review. Wow! <laughs> like okay. I was obsessed with the Oscars, so big movies. and I was obsessed with movies. And and I was I was brought up by parents who loved movies, and they were quite young when they had me, so they couldn't afford babysitters. So they took me to all the movies. So I was I was really lucky that I saw a lot of movies. It was in the blood. Younger. And you mentioned and the Oscars. So just to skip forward a little bit, and this is a spoiler alert, uh, this worked out quite well for you because uh, you have an Oscar nomination for your screenwriting now. Yes, that was a pretty amazing day. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and we'll talk about District 9, uh, which was your, your big hit and you were nominated for. Um, in particular. And I would say to people listening that it might be worth watching the film and then listening to this interview because I want to talk a little bit about the character and sure. um, some of the choices that you made uh, in that process and writing for the screen. So if you haven't watched District 9, you should watch it. It's an awesome movie as well. So, um, But there are other movies as well we can talk about. So anyway, you, 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 you got your scholarship. You went to your screenwriting school. Um, at some point, you met your husband. Wait, did you know Neil at this stage? No, I didn't. And then, so then I doubled. You should say who your husband is. Uh, uh, it's part relevant to the story. Neil Blomkamp, and we work together often. And he is, uh, he's, he's a director. He yeah. directed District 9. Yeah. So uh, as soon as I graduated from film school, I pretty much immediately went back to that job where I did the Jumanji uh, breakdown, even though it had been quite a few years earlier and said, I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> you need to hire me again. And this time I'm going to uh, try and make contacts with uh, LA people so that I can become a famous screenwriter. And uh, so I was lucky. And the CEO at the time, who I had been his assistant previously, and the person that replaced me, it had been eight years prior, she was just about to leave. And uh, creature of habit. So he, was, he would rather. And so I said, OK, well, I'll come back and be your assistant again if you'll also let me do PR. So I got to do the PR at the company, so I was able, it was definitely best. I met all local people for film, and then I would also meet LA people that he was dealing with. So I made, made some, some I, I wouldn't say I made any contacts that, that did anything, but it made me feel extremely comfortable in that world. How important is, is the contact business in Hollywood, is it? Um, is it essential to be a networker? or Because some people will listen to this and uh, um, hate the idea of the whole networking thing. Well, I feel writers. pretty strongly about networking because um, when I around that time uh, women in film in Vancouver was great and I was on the board um, and they had a big component at that time that was about networking it absolutely made my stomach turn because it's the kind of networking that I think is terrible to teach people and they're all different people now and I'm sure it's wonderful so this is a long like I said 20 years ago but it I do not believe in purposeful networking at all. People can sniff it, they can smell it, they know. Um, I think that what, I think writers can often be very introverted, so I think that you need to encourage yourself to actually go to events. And if you meet someone that you have an authentic, real connection or conversation with, then that's great. Yeah. And you should never force it. You should never, um, it's, you can just tell 
and it does and I never I didn't ever feel comfortable doing that which is why it's great I also encourage people that are uh, younger and just starting out if they want to be a director or a writer or something I'm like go be somebody's assistant mm. because being somebody's assistant is the best way to get to know the world and the people and realize that they're just like you that and that that's probably the most comforting thing there is so yeah. that's the kind of networking that I endorse so just be a friendly person be interested well, if you you're not people. friendly, don't be friendly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> be yourself, really, be because because okay. there's going to be someone that's not friendly that maybe you're going to make a connection with because okay. they recognize why you're not friendly. So just honestly, be yourself, but put yourself step outside of your comfort zone and put yourself in that position would be my biggest advice because it's hard for all of us. I'm I wouldn't say I'm an introvert, but I even still. Uh, sometimes are like, oh, it'd be so easy to stay at home and watch TV. And it's like, no, you know, you should put yourself out there. You should go. You should, you know, you should go on that business trip. You should have that meeting in person instead of on Skype. And it's you make connections. Real connections are always better. Okay, I should say the noise that people might be able to hear outside is is seaplanes. Yes, because it's amazing. Yeah. Vancouver Harbour here. Uh, is it the harbour? Do you call it harbour? Yes. Um, there are this succession of seaplanes. I guess taking tourists on little trips around. And it looks, it looks incredible, but you can hear them revving up every now and again. I did do a time lapse, which will drop into this, um, this video, so people can see that. Just thought I'd mention that because it's noisy. Um, okay, so you go back to that company, you're doing a bit of PR, you're networking, but in an organic way, should we call it that? Yes, you yes, know, like Normal way, so. not forced way. Yeah. Um, and then how did that, how did you end up on District 9? Later? Well, Neil, my now husband, uh, actually worked at... Uh, at Rainmaker was the company. He worked there as uh, an animator and he left three weeks before I came back. And so we didn't ever work together, but it, they actually had a pub on the premises. So it was quite a party environment. So we got drunk together. <laughs> yeah, we, I think we might have. I think it was an 80s party the first night we hung out there. And so he, uh, he actually, the first time we spoke ever was he called to ask permission to shoot some sort of zombie thing in the basement. Right. And as the president's assistant, it was up to me to give him permission or not. And, of course, I had heard about this Neil Blomkamp guy who was even though he had he was directing music videos at the time he he was very evidently going to make in, incredible things so i i did know who he was so i did give him permission okay <laughs> yeah. and uh and you started seeing each other at some point yeah or was i that, would say i don't know on that side of it we'll try and get professional but obviously you got together as well at we did and... it was at that okay. 80s party where the interest was expressed and okay, okay. Uh, probably about about i don't know six months was he dressed as maverick from top gun or... uh no he was just dressed as himself i went more the uh knots landing look oh, but he actually just okay. came as himself i we've believe watching, i was wearing a pink suit we've been and watching feathered some hair. amazing hallmark tv haven't we this uh, one's quite gripping a lot of that is shot here <laughs> oh is it actually neverland my tea salon they did a hallmark movie it could in well have been in this one <laughs> we were following the fortunes of cindy who was unlucky in love at every Aww. turn but until she the a... third act <laughs> yes exactly yeah the third act is coming we're missing it now um yeah okay so let's talk about district nine then so okay. I, I know that neil had a, a short first yes. of all which uh he had a few shorts a, around and this alive was one in of them. well yeah he did um first he did tetraval I mean, he'd been shooting and shooting and shooting forever, but he, the ones that, the first one that got put online, that he put online was Tetraval, and it was, uh, he wanted to start shooting commercials. And so it was a commercial for a policing robot. Uh, Happy. Yes. <laughs> but uh, so that was one minute, it kind of broke the internet. And then he did a live in Joburg, and, uh, and that was kind of set up the world. He went into, uh, into Soweto and interviewed people and said that, you know, aliens are coming, they need your house. And to, in South Africa at the time, aliens meant people from outside of South Africa. And then he used that footage and put in aliens. And so that was uh, a pr pretty brilliant project that he did. That, that I didn't have anything to do with that, except for what are you doing in that room? Because uh, sometimes he does things where he just wants to surprise me and show me the end product. And that was one Raka a short film that he did uh, for his Oat studio was another one. Those two were just surprises. <laughs> so and at some point that that short picks up more serious interest or um, that it did. I mean, there was there was offers from studios to turn that into a feature, and about the time that we were in talks on that, um, uh, Peter Jackson uh, 
got a hold of Neil to direct Halo. So we moved with our daughter to New Zealand to direct Halo, and that went in Wellington, and so that was about four months before that tanked. And, so this uh, is the spin-off from the video game. Yeah. The world's greatest video game, yes. by the way, Halo. Um, I've actually read all the novels, Stephen. Have you? <laughs> yeah, and that, that film didn't come to anything, did it? No, I think oh. I think it's a TV series now. I mean, it, it, okay. it comes, it goes, it comes, it goes, it comes yeah. and goes. There's a lot of players that have to agree, so I think it's been a tough project. Which, and this sort of introduces us to the vagaries of Hollywood. I yeah. mean, there'll be people listening to this whose books have been optioned 15 years yeah. ago, and as Douglas Adams famously said, it's going to be made into a film any decade now. Yeah. Um, it's, so it's a rough business. It's true, and I, I have to say I've optioned books and with the best of intentions and tried my absolute hardest to get them made, but and and the options I've I've renewed and still finally it's it's yeah it, it's tough to get films made it really really yeah. is it but, is but when Peter Jackson shows interest and Peter Jackson yes, of course Lord was, of the Rings and that was good so yeah when Halo went away and he knew we'd moved our daughter and he's like he and Fran they, that's his, his wife who is also his brilliant writing partner uh, they said you know that short film why don't you guys why don't you guys just stay around and develop that so we stayed in New Zealand and wrote for a year it took us a year to write it and uh, and and Cassidy, our daughter's life, she says, was forever changed. She loved New Zealand. <laughs> okay. So it took you a year to write it. it did. Wow. Let's talk yeah. about that then. So you start yeah. with this idea that Neil's got of, uh, and you've mentioned it's why I say it's it's useful to watch District Nine in advance of this interview. But if you haven't watched District Nine in advance of this interview, in short, the film starts maybe three months after this mothership has arrived overhead, uh, Johannesburg. Johannesburg, yes. And then what's fast, what is brilliant about that, and I guess it's what Neil does very well, and you've done very well with the script, is, is, is the normalisation. Because if you think if aliens arrived here, it would be like the biggest thing in the world. But three months down the line when it's done nothing, people are going to be going about their normal business and also getting a little bit kind of, when things start interfering with them, which goes on later, they break in and they find, because nothing happens with the mothership, so they, they bust into it and they find what looks like a almost biblical situation from uh, sub-Saharan Africa in the 80s where people were starving, malnourished, and these are the aliens, which is the thing that nobody I can imagine would think of as a story twist on aliens coming to Earth. Yeah, yeah. No, Neil gets credit for, uh, uh, he, he came up with that, that premise, and that was what was mostly in the short. So we knew that's what we were starting with, but we didn't know who the characters were. We didn't okay. know what happened. So to that, them. Was a, that was that so was we kind of had the world. Okay, that was the world from the short. That was where you yeah, started that's, effectively that's, at the beginning of this year long process. Yes. And so uh, Vickers, the main character hadn't been thought of at that stage. No. No. That he came a, a long time later. We we had some twins called Todd Liso and Dandy and we had all these <laughs> there's, there's in my head there's so many district nines. And uh, how that came about was we were in South Africa for a wedding. And so we brought, we had uh, Weta build an MNU vest. And MNU. MNU is the name of the company oh. that, that, oh, yes, so we yes, knew, yes, we yeah. knew MNU. We yeah. had the vest, we brought the vest with us, and we had, it was Neil, myself, Charlto, because Charlto, who ultimately was Vickers, was Neil's friend, but also was going to produce the film. Okay. And so then this is the actor who the played. The actor. And Vickers, then Trent, yeah. who was the DP of the film. So the four of us were sitting in this hotel room, we had a camera and Trent who was the DP and we're like, okay, what are we gonna do? We've gotta shoot something, we're here. Let's do like a proof of concept or something to help us. And it's like, well, who's gonna put the vest on? I was like, well, I'm certainly not putting the vest on. <laughs> and again, Trent said, well, I have the camera. And it's like, well, I'm the director. So producer puts the vest on. And we go into Soweto. And all of a sudden, Charlotte transforms into he gave himself a different name, but he was saying that it was his first day because he took a place because Vickis, uh, Vickis was, had been fired or killed or something. And I just love the name Vickis. And we had candies and he was saying to the, to the kids, you know, here's the sweetie man. And so we did all that. We shot it. It was good. It was fun. It was fun. And then we went home, and I could not get the sweetie man out of my head and Vickis, the name Vickis. And so Neil took the footage and uh, went to Peter and Fran and said, check this guy out. Like, he's not an actor. 
So but he hadn't acted at that no. stage. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, he was, he had a visual effects company and he was a producer and Neil's childhood friend. Wow. Yeah. It was a fun phone call when Neil called him and said, so do you want to be a movie star? <laughs> I'm really shocked because he yeah. plays a, he's a very uh, realistic form of acting yeah. that he does. Yeah. In that. He was very convincing he, right he, from the beginning. He, he put everything into it. And he every scene, because you don't shoot in order, um, he tracked, he, he had a system where he said where, what level what his emotion should be at. What stage like because he, yeah. he becomes a much he more truly desperate did. person. Yeah, no, he really did a great job for us. So going out and shooting bits, playing with ideas, is part yeah. of the process of trying to work out what the story is going to be. I mean, it was for me. Everything is different. Always, there is like sometimes I use recipe cards, sometimes I don't, sometimes I draw pie charts. Sometimes, like and to me, there is it's never the same. It's kind of like whatever works, whatever gets you there. Yeah. Try everything, and in that case, that is definitely what helped my process for sure. Uh, and the other thing is the film has quite a strong theme to it mm. and uh, a Neil South African. Mm. And so that is evident really in what he's sort of exploring in the film. So I'm, I'm assuming that starts at a very early stage when you're thinking about how the screenplay is going to work out is what you want to say. Oh, I mean, 100% for Neil, uh, it, was, it was apartheid, you know, using aliens. So for me, I thought if I'm going to bring something to the project, I need to think of it not as a South African. And so I just used oppression in general. And it actually got me kind of depressed because historically I'm like, oh, it just repeats itself yeah. over and over again. And so then at that time, at that age of my screenwriting, I was like, okay, the model is you're meant to present an answer with your voice. And I remember sitting there and, and being like, I don't know what the answer is. I do not know how to solve. Like if someone put me in charge of South Africa, I d don't know what magic, well, I'm, I don't know. And so for me, the theme that I wrote with was to be kind, as kind as you can to the person next to you. And that to me was the only answer I could come up with. And that's what I wrote with. Okay. And, uh, and the film does have a kind of bleak message, I think. I don't think it's, I don't, I don't, that's not a criticism. It's, yeah. it's just, it is a rather bleak yes. situation of how humanity will behave in certain yeah. situations, well, unfortunately. Sadly, it's true. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I, it, I hate that that film is so applicable now. Yeah. It's with my daughter's in university and her friends are in different universities all around the world right now. And every time one comes across District 9 in their schooling, they tell her and then she tells me and I'm shocked at how much it comes up and in how many different classes because it's current yeah. right now. And that makes me really sad. And I think just this week there's been some footage uh, of a group of men shave, head shaved, bound on a railway station in China. Have you seen this? No, I haven't. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it could be from a film. It could be from yeah. District 9, this, this footage. So yeah, just go show that. Anyway, without depressing ourselves too yes, much, yeah. we got, think about the high tea behind <laughs> exactly. you. We've got that to come after the interview. Um, so you send Peter Jackson... Uh, who's ultimately the paymaster, I guess. He's the kind of guy who's who's going to enable the film to be made or not. So you yes. have to consult with him at this stage. Um, although I would quite like to talk about the financing of films as well, because that's a mystery, I think, to most people. How is it someone once said, once you understand how films get made, you'll, you'll be amazed that any film ever it, gets made. It, yeah, <laughs> it's true. And it, it's kind of like I was saying with the creative process, every film's different. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it really is, so... So Peter liked this bit, the Vickers thing, yes. and he liked yeah, and he had Charlotte. he had faith in in Charlotte, which a, a first time actor with a first time director, it's yeah, it was a gamble, yeah, for sure. Hey, they were fresh faced in Star Wars in seventy seven, weren't yeah. they? I mean, yeah. Harrison Ford was the most experienced, <laughs> but they true. Were kids. Um, and then you then start developing as a the script has a, a bit of a start and a purpose at that stage yes. that you didn't have before. Yeah, and then you start writing, I guess. Yes. Well, we'd been writing the whole time. Okay. I mean, we wrote and we wrote and we wrote and then we threw out and we so ripped and we complete, fought. And... <laughs> you have complete versions of the film that have just sat there I, on your computer? Or... I mean, we didn't ever write, get to the end and then toss it out. We, we would talk. I mean, our writing process together is a bit strange. We try never to talk to each other in person about it. We email back and oh, forth. Oh, do you? Because to try and keep your relationship. It's true. Yeah. yeah. The only time I could ever corner him is uh, is if he's in the shower. If it's like a really desperate thing, and then I want him to hear me out with with because he can't leave the I room. Think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But no, it's very. He's he's extremely good at, at leaving so, things at the door. Okay. And having a nice family environment, whereas I'm 
Oh, you carry it with you. <laughs> Wake up! I know what Vickers should do. <laughs> I think I'm like you. I'd struggle a little bit, but it's just a yeah. good trick if you can leave it at the door. Yeah, no, he's um, always been really good at that. Uh, which is also a good way of being better at writing and all big, being more creative because you do need a break from it. And yeah. that's the other thing I was going to ask I you. Agree. This sounded like a really intense year. It was. Yeah, it was a very intense year. Did you year. try and force yourself to have breaks away so that it allow your mind well, to recover? Well, co writing, that gives you the break because it's like, okay, your turn. You take it now. And so, and, and we would come back to Vancouver every so often. I remember I'd stay with my mom when I came back and just be locked away typing and writing scenes. And so, yeah, it was, it, it was a lot of writing for sure. So I'm, I'm glad it had a good outcome. Okay. So you had different ideas, different bits of writing. You start now with Vickers. We get to the point, of course, you don't know at this stage it's going to be the the end point, it still could be another transition to something else. But it turned out you did go with this Vickers character. I think what, what to us, the turning point, we often refer to that now. It's like, Neil just had it on a script he's working on. He's like, I just had the Vickers is going to change uh, okay. moment. Yeah. And it's like once we knew he was changing into an alien, then it was like just forward from there. So when did that? I'd say six months in. Okay. Yeah, six months in. Okay, so that's a pivotal moment in the film when you get sprayed with... Yes, that was what, that was like, that was what we needed to be able to, it was our post in the ground that we were able to go from there. And did you have, when you were doing this, a, a sort of traditional film three act idea? Did you want it to fit into Heroes, that? Or Her we... Hero's Journey. I mean, honestly, because we went through it so much, I applied every film theory possible. Okay. I, I remember doing the, the, the sequence one where I've actually never looked at that one again since, but I remember having the colored boards and it was, I think that's in that I don't even remember who that. Well, the outer sequence, the backward sequence one. It had the no. There's A, B, C, and I wrote those cards. But I mean, it, and Hero's Journey. I mean, it's just so ingrained in your head that I think you can't help but apply that. And then I was taught with McKee, so I say, I like to say four acts when really it's three. Most people say three, but the second one is sixty minutes as opposed to thirty chunks. So okay, so. It's kind of all in there. But you still had all options open as you were going along with this. <laughs> Desperate. <laughs> um, and then Vickers starts to turn into an alien, which was a bit of a surprise when you're watching the film yeah. that something's going on. But then when you think, you, you very quickly got used to the idea of these aliens, aliens being around. But that is, that is so normalised in the film. People have so quickly adapted to this situation. You almost have to remind yourself they're aliens. And the... Um, the visual effects, which Neil, I think it's Neil's background yeah. as well, is I thought it sort of described once in, as a review as lo-fi. Yeah. It's sort of been grainy and grained. It's just... Yeah. It's like I, an afterthought. Yeah. 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 Which makes it all... It has a particular Seems. atmosphere, this film. Yeah. It's almost non -ex Well, maybe the first Alien film had that as well. Yeah. That kind of grungy oil rig yeah. type environment. Um, so you you have this moment. And then when you say you write as a team... Do you literally hand it over to each other? Or we you don't... do. We don't ever sit, like, me over his shoulder, or that would never happen. We pass back and forth by email. <laughs> what, a scene each, or...? Uh, no, usually the script, but, I mean, in the beginning stages, it definitely, probably an act. I think we would do an act, and we'd spend a long time on a certain act. Okay. Although, but then as you get towards the end, it's like, okay, you know, this chunk isn't working. Let's pass it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and hope somebody cracks it. And when you're writing in the second six months period, mm -hmm. when you're writing, do you have at this stage a, a plotted out to the end? Or are you writing along <laughs> and still changing? We, we wrote the end many times. There, okay. was, there was a lot of people killing uh, Kubis. <laughs> <laughs> I think at one point we even had uh, no. Actually, I'm not. Supposed, I'm not supposed to tell all oh, the bad okay. endings. This is like the um, alt endings. It did take quite a long time to die. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. it did die in the end. Sorry, spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, okay, so you, but you. Okay, that's the very end. But you, what I mean is, when you're writing, when you're saying, well, you're writing on one act, you know what's following and how more or less it's going to end at this stage. Or is that still open? As you, are you, is there a discovery process going on as you're writing? I mean, we. I am a huge outliner. Okay. So Neil is not an outliner. I'm an outliner. Um, so even if we're done the first draft, I'll go back and do the outline again. Like I'll take what it's turned into and re-outline. I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in the math of the outline, finding your problems and your. So as we would change stuff, 
it's like, yeah, sure, stuff stuff changed for sure. We were lucky that we got to do reshoots too. So even in the reshoots, stuff changed. But they actually kind of went back to the original. So Okay. And you're, um, when you're writing, Neil's got a background in visual effects, so he's got in his mind how that's going to yeah. happen, uh, whereas I suppose some writers might write stuff that a visual effects guy would then look at and say, how are we going to do that, by the way? But he knows how this he knows. works. Um, but are you having to be aware of the practical side of, for you in particular, the practical side of filming, you, you're writing a scene thinking, actually, I'm writing this, but can it be done type thing? It's funny. This, this, I mean, that was, we were writing it in 2007, 2008. So it's my, my skill set and knowledge. I had worked in a visual effects house, so I sort of had an idea with that. And I'd been on a lot of shoots. So, but I always believe and tell everybody try not to write with budget in mind because okay. it all comes down to budget um what in district nine the big thing was there's a little alien in there there's a son little cj he's never named in the film but he's little cj and very early on i needed little cj to be in there because i had a daughter and i i just needed that in there thematically or i wasn't able to i just i just had to have it there i needed some little glimmer of light in a very depressing topic and there was no budget because you had to model a whole different alien. Right. And so Neil's like, no, we can't have him. And that was, I call it my tie myself to the train track thing. That was when he's in the shower. I'm like, no, yeah. we have to have him. <laughs> so we actually, when he started shooting, he was a maquette because I couldn't afford to do him in visual effects. And that maquette lives at my house now and it makes me very happy. Like an actual sculpted alien. So they'd be like, oh, mm. okay. <laughs> Terrible. It was so bad. So very quickly, it was so bad that they found the budget. So I was able to have little CJ in the film. So since that experience, I am very aware of putting things in a script that may not be able to exist because of budget and how crushing that would be to the film. Because that when I was told he couldn't be in there, that was absolutely crushing and in pain. It was, it was almost the levity in it for me in the yeah. a lightness that I needed. Yeah. Although I remember when I saw The Little Alien, I wondered if it was a child or not. Because oh, no. I, I wondered if we were, yeah. because maybe Little Aliens are the old ones or something. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Because it's quite, he's a hands-on child, isn't he? Yeah. He's got his hands all over the computers. Oh, yeah. And, he kind of saves the day, and, really. Yeah, flies the ship. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So he was a child. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was. Definitely. Definitely. He was Christopher Johnson's little son. Yeah. Yeah. Who's the bigger alien. Yes. Who Vickers very unkindly hits. And yes. that's, um, that's that true. brings me on to the question of, of Vickers, your main character. Yes. Now, a lot of people will say, life's a lot easier for you when you have a sympathetic character who you want to do well and you want to win and you can identify a little bit with. I don't think Vickers is any of those things, is he? Yeah, I know. I know that the theory is that that's the case, but I think even in books... I mean, I love an unsympathetic character because I love, I mean, it's all about, isn't reading all about, I mean, empathy in a way, like you're learning to live in someone else's skin. And it's like, I don't want to learn what it's like to be in this perfect, nice person's skin. I want to know what it's, why that awful person is awful. And I want to know that there's hope for them. It's like Scarlett O'Hara. Maybe, maybe mm. it was that from mm. the, from the beginning. Like, it, I don't know. I'm, I'm a, I'm very bored by likable characters. I really am. I, I, I prefer films and books where the character is flawed. And yeah. I would argue that it's actually easier to engage an audience with a flawed character. Yeah. And there is some redemption. It has to be. Otherwise, yeah. 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 Did you consider not having, having him kind of a, a sort of... Uh, he's an unempathetic, a bureaucrat. In, I hate to use the end. I'm not going to use the Nazi... I'll park Nazi, but you you do need a bureaucracy to enforce horrible ideas. Yes. And he looks right from the beginning like the weakling who doesn't stand up to people who yeah. goes out with his clipboard yeah. and ethnic cleanses yeah. an area. That's how he starts the film, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, did you consider him being no redemption in there at all? Or is there always going to be some... No, I don't think you could do a film without... Okay. I mean, you could do the opposite and have him start out nice and end up that, but I don't think you could just... That's bad film right yeah well it's brilliant uh, really interesting talking and hearing yeah. the process um and you then go into production yes and are you allowed to is there is there script tweaking during that period oh yeah a lot i mean a lot of improv 
in, okay. in the initial eviction scenes, they uh, would do it as scripted and then just go. And so the poor Julian, the editor, and Neil editing it was a nightmare because there was just so much absolutely hilarious material. And you know, Neil would say, okay, and because Jason Cope was the alien and they were friends. Jason actually was an actor. And so their chemistry together, they would just get going and it it was, there's a great stuff, but it would go way high and then they'd bring it back down. And, and how does that actually work? Because you're to, is it Chris the alien? Christopher Johnson. Christopher Johnson, <laughs> yes. yeah. Um, how, so what did it, that look like on set? Uh, poor Jay had to wear, it was very cold in Johannesburg, and he had to wear the tight, the tight little gray suit um, that well, these has like little balls. balls. Yeah. Okay, we see yeah. the pictures of those. Yeah, and it was freezing because so it's he's, winter. He's that. And in the film, oh, this is another interesting choice. Uh, you don't translate the aliens, I don't think, at all in the film. They, you, the, the people <laughs> that seem to understand it, but I don't think there's any subtitles at any point for the aliens speak. It's so Please. funny that I don't even know, because in my head, the, it plays, it's funny, we, the last time I watched District 9 was in San Francisco, they did a showing, and we went down, and Neil and I sat in the back, and we laughed, and we laughed, and it, we enjoyed it so much, but that was probably five, six years ago, I have not watched did it Did anyone in then. the theatre realise how the director and writer? Yeah, oh yeah, because it, that's oh, well, what it was. Oh, you were not so okay, you didn't just turn up, <laughs> I think some, some people do those. The, we, um... Oh, we did do that a lot with yeah. District 9, yeah, we did yeah. do that, we'd go, that's yeah, on. Well, not, I didn't need a hat. But. Not, right, there's one famous Hitchcock, Hitchcock used to do it. Yeah. Oh, it's to, great. And tap on the shoulder. And some the people, best. I read about someone else who used to do it and then go to the projectionist and tell him he got the sound balance wrong and stuff. Yeah, and it, Neil yeah. probably would have if, yeah. if it had been off. Yeah. It was fun to do it in different countries too because with District 9 in particular, what people would appreciate and laugh at or not was, was polar opposite. Oh, uh, yes. Was, that was Cultural. very interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so you're doing rewrites based on things that changed during those improv sessions or, or do you just film a scene and Neil and you think actually didn't work as well as you wanted and rewrite it or you can't remember that <laughs> it's all a blur it's an awful stressful blur yeah was, it, was the production stressful I th for me it was yeah okay yeah no I think so yeah how long was the the sort of principal photography I think they uh, called it I they? wasn't there for all of it because we didn't want to take our daughter there so I brought her back to Vancouver. So I would sort of duck in and out, and uh, it a little. It was it was a volatile time, uh, just in South Africa okay. at that time with xenophobia, and it was kind of what we wrote was becoming real. Mm. So it was a bit scary, and so Neil would get very tense having me around and worrying. It was it was a it was a bit of a volatile shoot. So I was in and out, um, and it was like with Chappie when I wasn't there, I would get to screen screen every night in our house I would get you know, the footage and so at that time that didn't happen so it was I'd be a nervous wreck if I wasn't there seeing what was happening that's the is they call it the dailies yeah it's an old old yeah. um old term I guess when they developed the film and that that that's a process that happens on the film well I mean I yeah. it treat me as if I don't know anything about the way films are made so <laughs> I don't really but you sit there and you watch what you've done during the day yes and then you're, obviously from a writing point of view, working out, has it worked? Is this what we want? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's so helpful. It's amazing. And at, at District 9 at that time, it's Neil would go back. Uh, he wouldn't even get any sleep. He'd go back to his his place he was staying at, and it would be on DVD, I guess. Right. And then you'd go and watch it and try yeah. and get four hours of sleep and then be back in the morning. Intense time. Yeah, it was an intense time. And then post-production, where you do the editing, yeah. and uh, in the days of film, you were pretty limited to what, you know, you, you ran the camera, you could hear oh, it, it wasn't running. wasn't film. Yeah, no, I'm saying. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're digital, so yeah. instead of ending up with yeah. 20 minutes of rushes from that day, you end up with two hours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he had a, l a big Lots, a yeah, mountain to climb. Yeah, they edited here for a long time, which was great. Here in Canada. Here in Canada, yeah. and then back in New Zealand again, so, so uh, Peter could be there to look on and... Give and then, of course, you had to build the aliens, all the visual effects. And that stuff. happened here as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And there's a happy ending to this story because it was hugely successful. There it is. I, yeah. I think oh. I read a figure, three figures of millions of dollars it took. Do you know the? Do you know the public? I don't. Figure? I don't actually. I think I read some 110 million or something like that. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. I, I maybe maybe uh, domestically. So a lot more than that I worldwide. Think so. I'm, I think Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't. I'm not, I don't retain the numbers. And nothing gets you uh, 
noticed more in Hollywood than having a huge commercial success. So yeah, that's did true. life really change lucky. for you and Neil at that point? You know, I think the fact that because we were together before, I mean, we've been together now for 17 years. And it's like, it's kind of great because it didn't change in that sense. It's like, we're no different than when we met at that 80s party. And I like that so much. Uh, but the opportunities definitely, I'm very grateful for the opportunities and the doors that it did open. Um, but it's, it's yeah, life still feels... <laughs> but do you become, so professionally you become, I mean, you become sought after. You, you're an Oscar nominated screenwriter and he was an Oscar, no, well, he's Oscar nominated for screenwriting. Yes. A director of a hugely successful film. Yeah. So does that suddenly mean instead of you constantly going to people, are people starting to approach you? To... Yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, it's, um, I've sort of, I haven't been, I haven't pursued writing as much. I really, really took being a mum seriously and film the film world is so stressful yeah <laughs> so I didn't uh I I turned down a lot for sure and I I did a few things and you do a lot of things that don't get made but you they get paid for them and you learn when you write them which has been really great but now that she's off in university I'm sort of back 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 at it I think a little more than I had been I sort of I'm back baby I feel like it was a lazy and it's also that it's not lazy. what being a mother is not lazy no but I mean writing wise but I mean I was I was always writing and always working on stuff yeah. but I definitely wasn't a lot of people that had that opportunity to perhaps sort of seize the day a little bit more than than I did well, that's rubbish mm -hmm. you uh, you did exactly the right thing and your daughter's doing really well at, yes, know, yes. So. no I don't regret anything yeah. that's for sure so a big thing that happened to Neil, when I guess you took a slight step back, uh, is that he then directed Elysium yes. with Matt Damon. He, he wrote and directed it. So he, he wrote, wrote that one and, by I himself. I didn't realise he wrote it. Yeah, no, he wrote that okay. one by himself. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. that was another big film. That must have been commercially successful. I went it to, was. I went to the cinema to see that and I mean, it was just one of those films that people went to see. Yeah. Um, and again, sort of thematically, you can start to see. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Of, course, of course he wrote it. Now I'm thinking about yeah. it because it is that same them and us. Yes. Uh, situation, literally up in the space station, yeah. them and us stand on the ground. Yeah. Um, was that, what was that like for you? Were you presumably taking a back seat oh, at that it stage? It was wonderful. Yeah. There was no stress. There was no... And Neil left his stuff at the door when he came in? Or did he come in? Um, you know, in, in that house, he, he had a man house in the backyard. So he left it. He left it out there. But no, but you know what? He didn't have to as much because it wasn't a stressful conversation because it wasn't mine. So I'd give my opinion and he could take it or leave it. And it was actually really, really nice. And how did he get Elysium made? Uh, that he did it with um, MRC so and Sony again. So it was, uh, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, it it was it, MRC was the lead on it, and then Sony was the distributor. Okay, and that's. Do you think Elysium got made because District Nine was successful? Is that one oh, thing? Oh, yeah, hundred yeah. percent for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Neil's bankable. He his films, even if uh, Chappie was not a critical success, it was still a financial success. So. So Chappie next. Chappie was next. Okay, and Chappie from the very first short film you mentioned before about the the policeman. Just explain yes. the concept of Chappie. So Chappie is uh, a, a, a robot that is, he's a policing robot that's made uh, sentient and he is uh, abducted by a gang and they're raising him to help them. Clever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what was your role in Chappie? Co-writer. Co-writer. Yeah. So you, again, you're back in the game Same here. Same as District 9. Yeah, it, it's actually funny. Neil came down uh, around the time he was, I can't remember at what point in Elysium was, and uh, there was a song by DeAntwert that we had playing all the time. And he said, I have this idea. He woke up. I have this idea of this robot and the and, and, and Ninja and Yolandi and they kidnap him and this happens. And at this point, I'd been so happy not working on Elysium, but I was like, I need to work on this with you. I need to, because it has the element of the kid-like stuff that I want that just captures my imagination. It's uh, Amy Pascal at Sony, called, she said once, she goes, how's my uh, Pinocchio film doing? Yeah. I was like, Pinocchio? And I was like, oh. Yes. <laughs> Good observation. Yeah. Uh, and did you find your experience, obviously, in District 9 made 
the co-writing and the process for, sure. for Chappie. Yeah, it, it a was a bit more structured. Yeah, there was no yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah. no, <laughs> we're, we're good now. There weren't 45 versions of Chappie. No, but, Cha yeah. Chappie was a very quick write. Yeah. yeah, there was one version where we decided to set it in L.A. and we wrote that one and then we went back to the other one. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about your children's book project in a minute, okay. I promise. We are going to come on to that. But to wrap up the film side of it, to wrap up, which is a film expression, oh. uh, to wrap up the film side of it, um, what would you, so for people listening, so you've got people writing novels mm -hmm. who would like the idea of their novels being made into films. Potentially, you've got people listening who would, would like to get into screenwriting. Yeah. Any sort of top tips? Uh, let's start with, with trying to get your writing onto the screen. What should people be thinking about? Um, you know, for me, if I'm thinking about what's optionable, and I get approached to write option or to to do uh, adaptations a lot, um, and so I'll read whatever sent to me by the agents. I should be clear on that. Yeah. Um, yes. And because uh, actually, I've got my book. Yeah. If it's a job <laughs> that it's it's because I will often be a writer for hire as opposed to developing my own. So if I'm being offered a job. I will read the book, which apparently is very rare. Most people won't. Right, we'll read the back cover. And uh, if blow. I think something's going to make it, there's two things for me that it, it, it's not necessarily the plot. For me, it's the characters and it's the theme. And what I've kind of figured out is, because you don't know why it, it, it goes, I mean, theme, it's got to be, if I'm going to adapt it, it has to be a theme that speaks to me. So weirdly, I don't know why oppression seems to speak to me because I'm so not oppressed. But uh, for some reason, I really go for that. It's like even the book, it's, <laughs> it's oppression, oppression. But, um, and characters. And I have this very crazy test that I use for writing screenplays that I will apply to my analysis of a book on whether it's adaptable or not or if you'd have to change the characters, because obviously if you're going to adapt a book to film, you have to change the plot, you have to change the structure, you have to change everything. But I don't think you should change the characters. I, that I don't want to have to change. You, you, can, you can massage them a little differently, but you shouldn't change them. And so I use, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Enneagram. The Enneagram. Enneagram, E-N-N-E-A, any, I Sounds guess, like a medical lot. procedure. Yeah, I mean. yeah. No, well, someone said to me once, it was a producer actually, she said, what kind of movies do you want to write? And I'm like, I want to write everything. And she's like, oh, you're a seven. I'm like, what do you mean I'm a seven? She's like, it's your Enneagram. Go look it up. So right away I looked it up and I then Enneagram seven. And I read it and was like, oh, I'm a seven. And it described me exactly. And so then I started reading all of it. I'm like, this is really interesting. And then I was like, wait a minute. Because each number, so there's nine personality types, but the, the key is that within the number of the Enneagram, there's levels of development. So if I'm a seven, there's one to nine levels on whether I'm like stark raving mad or whether I'm like really, really got it all going on meditating and happy and, and stable. And so to me, the characters in the book have to, you can tell, they have to ring true to their personality type and they have to shift in their development within the body of the work okay. for it to be interesting. And I have found that the books that I'm like, no, no, that's adaptable. It's because those choices have been made without knowing it. To me, that's just good writing, is that it's preferably multiple different personality types within the book, but that also that they shift. And then if something, it doesn't feel right in the book, it's often because the writer has blended their own personality and their number in with, and that you can kind of fix. But so to me, it would be definitely like pay very close attention to your characters because I think that's what we fall in love with. And your themes, you can't, I mean, you're going to write with your themes you're going to write with. I don't think you really have a choice. Um, but just be, just think about your theme maybe and yeah. be, be a, aware of it because those are the two things to me that yeah and that's as you say that's good writing advice even if you're not thinking about your book being adapted make yeah. sure your character yeah for sure it's has to me I, i'm all about character i yeah yeah for sure okay good well, i think we dealt with film yeah. Uh, or we could ask what's next. There's only all secrets. It's always secret. Ah, uh, there's guys. a few secrets always... going on. There's a few secrets going on. I'm actually uh, in talks on one project. I've never done this before. Um, of it's someone else's script, and they want some levity. Okay. 
to it. So I was like, oh, am I the funny girl with science yeah. fiction? <laughs> and I, so I, I read the script. It's a really good script. And I saw the proof of concept. And it's it's very commercial film. And uh, it's like, yeah, I think I think I could, like, with respecting the writer that wrote the original one, I think I could throw a little... Little yeah. levity into that's a it. big area in Hollywood the kind of rewrite yeah person, and I've never yeah. I've never done that so that's I, I, th I think I'm going to do that on this one which is kind of it's not as big of a commitment and uh, whether whether that kind of stuff's credited or not I don't know but mm. yeah we'll see yeah oh well, good luck with that yeah but and I'm working on working on some I stuff love with the Neil. Star Wars films anyway so it's obviously what she's doing <laughs> uh, okay so strangely on top of uh, this dystopian, oppression-filled sci-fi world that you've been living in <laughs> since the 90s is this rather charming, lovely book for children. Talk to us about this, Terry. So I have come up with a series of children's books. They're, the series is called Endangered and Misunderstood. And, uh, yeah, up, up there in the corner. And so the first three books, this is the first book in the series coming out November 18th. And uh, the first book, first three books are set in Africa. And then I'm going to jump to another continent. But I'm having trouble leaving Africa because there's an awful lot of endangered and misunderstood animals. So that one is about um, a lemur. Misunderstood animals. Misunderstood because the lemur, the reason he's endangered is because he's perceived as so hideously ugly and terrifying that if he points his middle finger at you, he has an extra long middle finger, it means death mm. to the village or you. So he has to be killed on sight. So he is almost extinct because he gets killed on sight because of this mythology around him being a bad luck omen. So I thought he needed the first book. And so it's called I, I which is the name of the lemur. In real life, he is an I.I. That's not a cute name I came up with for him. Um, well, I, you, when you say in real life, is not, is that... I.I. I is the name the... of this animal. Oh, okay. He is a lemur, but there's many different types of lemurs. Okay. So this, I, I. he's a nocturnal. He's actually the largest nocturnal primate. I'm going to really geek out and talk mm. about him. <laughs> but so this is I, I Gets Lucky, and uh, it's about him turning his luck around and being welcomed into the village and loved. And and there's a point to the books in terms of its... Uh, the, uh, the proceeds will go... Each book, I'm actually kind of excited about this, because each book, the proceeds will go to a different organization. So... Um, the, it's, it's funny, the proceeds from this book, I'm actually not allowed to say where it's going. Okay. Once I've gifted the money, then I'm I allowed to say, say I've given okay. the money, but I'm not allowed to say because this organization isn't allowed to partnership with anyone. So, but I am adamant that they, having visited and spent a long time on this, they're the ones that the money will best go towards the II. And I know the next book is about a pangolin, and that's actually going to go, I know where that's going, and then uh, the Okapi's the next you one. Say a, so. a what? A pangolin is the second one. He's actually the most trafficked animal in the world. So he really needs to be. And he's misunderstood that's because... It's terrible. I've never heard of it. A pangolin. Well, no, that's... I. It's good that the kids have generally heard of these animals. Okay. But it's good that you haven't because I'm trying to bring awareness to Not these. taken. No, Sorry. he's kind of like a... He, he's, he's kind of like a, an anteater with armor. And okay. the belief is that his uh, scales will make you more, more well, yeah. Viral. So he's very misunderstood. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> yes. something that will endanger you. It's the same with the yeah, ivory, isn't it? For sure. So. Okay. And an uh, amazing, amazing part of this book, an important part of any children's book, is the illustrations, oh, which I are so absolutely lucky. fabulous. Fantastic illustrations. Thank you. Yeah, Ivan uh, Salima, he's Ukrainian. And I searched and searched and searched and searched images to find someone that would capture an animal face with the kind of feeling and soul that I wanted. And I found a picture of a fox online. And then I, 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 I found him and I had to wait a year for him. And then I said, can, please, once I get you, can you do three books in a row for me? So he's working on the pangolin right now. And he just sent me the sketches for that book. And he is amazing. And he's so... Uh, his heart is in the animals. He's so about helping the animals. And he's so excited to be doing this for the animals too, which is really great. How brilliant. I'm going to get emails for not having heard of the pangolin like I did about Mae West. <laughs> um, okay. So, and in the interest of actually making some money and making a difference, you're self-publishing, which so, is the best was, way to make money. That was actually a really big decision. And I went to the London Book Fair, which is where I met you, to sit in on all the sessions and then go to the sessions with the publishers, traditional publishers, and... I'm really glad I've had the film experience that I've had because I was 
very aware that number one, financially, I wanted to do it on my own because it's more money for the animals then. But I also was very aware that I would get manhandled. And I have, I have, I've, with uh, a friend, Lisa, we started our own uh, printing press. She's got three books that she's putting out on it and I'm putting these out. And learning to be the publisher is so exciting. I'm just, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, so that, from a personal standpoint, I'm enjoying having control, but I'm also enjoying learning so much. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're, you guys have taught me so much too. It's just absolutely amazing. Well, I'm currently learning how to be a publisher as well. So we'll talk about yeah. that off camera yeah. probably. Um, and this is just out of interest. This is an Ingram Spark published. Uh, yes, that, is, book. that that was printed by uh, Ingram Spark. Yeah, and it's uh, it's they are the only ones the hardback, that do the hardcover. Yeah. So Amazon, I have the soft cover from Amazon, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. absolutely gorgeous. Well, too. We had some I was Selena really impressed. Fennec coloring books recently, which yeah. uh, print on demand on Amazon. I ordered one; they're fantastic. Yeah, I, I'm really. I need to order from every every country, so I've only had the U.S. one. So I need to order all the other ones and see how they compare. Yeah. I'm almost afraid to, because <laughs> really, what can you do about it? You can't do anything it about it. Should be uniformity of printing. So. You'd yeah. hope, wouldn't you? Yeah. But, uh, brilliant. Well, Terry, we have chatted, chatted for a long time. That's another. Yes seaplane yeah. bursts into life uh, next to us. Um, what a fantastic few years you've had. Uh, how exciting to have a huge hit on your hands with um, with District 9 and to, ex and to ride that wave, I guess, afterwards. But yeah, no, it's, I've, I've been really, really lucky. Really but down lucky. to the talent, so you deserve it. And we want to say good luck with this because it could make a real difference to, uh, Thank you. to the pangolins and the aye aye. I'm learning so much today. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Thank you. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go, Terry Tatchell, who uh, I invited into my hotel room in Vancouver. And guess what, Mark Dawson? Or James Blatch. I've actually invited Terry Tatchell into my hotel room in Vegas. There's a worrying trend of it. There is a here. trend. So swing the cameras around. What a surprise. <laughs> here she is at 20 Books Vegas. We don't normally do this, Terry. We normally do an interview and then we never speak again, but here you are. It's this hotel room lure thing. I actually put this at... Sorry. <laughs> do, you know, do you know how, film, do you know how filming works? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it's this thing, be, be careful future uh, podcast yeah. invitees when he invites you to his hotel room. <laughs> well, come over here, come and join us. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we caught up in Vancouver. It was really fun talking to you and illuminating. And I think what I took away from it was the it's a you know it's a collaborative process and lots of the people who listen to this podcast do work in isolation some do work with other people but in your world it's all about collaboration right yeah. that was my takeaway yeah for sure from beginning to end i mean the fact that i co-write makes it from right from the get-go but also i mean the finished product is is so many people Hell hundreds yeah. and hundreds of people putting their all into it and yeah it's nice and the person who produces the donuts to the person just yeah, the lighting. It's true. Yeah, it's true. It really is. Everyone's everyone's important to the finished product. So where are the donuts? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't bring the donuts. You fed no. us really well in Vancouver. That was yeah, no, the, yeah. The, yeah, the high tea was that was just a Vancouver treat. <laughs> I don't have an inn in Vegas. But. Now, what's happened since then? Because I think there was some, yeah, as, as usual, all secret stuff in the background going on. Have you got anything moving forward with either you or Neil? Um, Neil actually is in the works and just on the cusp of maybe something for sure, but because these things are never for sure till you're actually filming, I don't want to say too much. Okay. But yeah, hopefully things are looking positive. And I don't know when this comes out, but November 18th, I have my children's book launching. Yeah, which, so I was going to ask you about that. So yeah, that's, I'm excited about that. You, I can see you building up to that. You're very good at social media, so a lot of stuff. If you follow Terry on Twitter, you can see the children's books and the stuff moving there. And you introduced me to animals I've never heard of. Yeah, the whole idea is each book, the money gets donated to a charity that helps out that animal. So the first one is an eye eye. Next one is a pangolin. And then we have an okapi. So. Are those made up animals? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it of, feels like it. I've it heard does. of an okapi before. And have I, you? I, yeah, I, that seems to be the... the isn't no, that like an antelope or something? It, it's actually, it, it's called okapi loves his zebra pants because his closest relative is the right. giraffe, okay. but he's got a zebra bum. Okay. Well, you must be trained in biology for that kind of description. That's a... 
honest. I was like, I this is you. bomb. I can, that, that's my kids' bomb. Awesome. Fine, you can throw in like bomb and there's And is bomb the, the word in North book. America? Because I thought it was ass or something you said. Bomb means me something else, doesn't it? Oh, if you're yeah. a bum. It, it can mean a lot of things, as yeah, do okay. most words in North America. <laughs> well, we're in a Vegas hotel room, so anything goes. Right, look, Terry, thank you so much. For <laughs> I'm being... so glad I was able to elevate this. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for bringing that. We start quite low, so you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it was fun uh, having you here. We always intended to record this rap here, and of course it made sense, so we should let spring you. you as a little thank surprise yeah, at the end of it. You. So, no, um, anything else to say, Dawson? No, much. That's uh, we're done. Tatchel. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and, and Terry brings her friend who hides in the shadows <laughs> somewhere else in this, this hotel room. It's true. Go would, find her. Would you Go come find to this hotel room alone? <laughs> <laughs> Go on, you have to move faster than that. Is that the quickest he moves? It's, she's not in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that is been... Terry's friend, Lisa. I right, be I think this is Lisa's probably... Lisa's on piano. Yeah, this is the... Uh, um, this yeah, is... I think the name check is due. This yeah. is, Lisa Zampano does deserve a name check, and she did a fantastic interview for us, a testimonial interview while we were in Vancouver, which saw the light of day recently. Right, that's it. We're going to say goodbye from Vegas. We'll be returning to what, we, what passes for normality. Uh, next week so until then thank you so much indeed for joining us I'll speak to you again oh what should we say it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from him goodbye. goodbye get show notes the podcast archive and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com join our thriving facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash facebook support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishing show and join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.